Um, okay, sorry, just right. Uh, so this evening I'm going to talk about the engineering geohazard challenges for construction upon the Hyth Formation in Kent. And um, this talk is basically, uh, I suppose, uh, relates to several projects uh, carried out in the last uh, 10, 10, 10 to 15 years um, in, in various parts of Kent involving the, uh, the, the Hyth Formation. Um, and and, and uh, hopefully will be of interest uh, to the to the audience. Uh, so the talk content will be uh, going to start with introduction to the geological setting of the Hyth Formation. Then I'm going to go on to karstic and periglacial weathering effects. Then look at photo images of historical and modern exposures, and then spend a while looking at substance case studies. So to start looking at the geology, um, probably the easiest place to find information is, is obviously on the published um, sheet 288 Maidstone, although it's aging a bit now. You can see there the sequence is still the same. So that we, that we have formation set of beds, of course. And so you can see the other field clay sitting there in the Cretaceous uh, uh, sort of profile uh, with Sandgate uh, formation above and the, and the other field clay formation uh, below. And the height uh, formation itself is of variable thickness. You can see on the on the section line, there's a question mark in front of the zero. It's kind of dips northwards and thins as it does so. And some borehole records to the north suggest that it may be absent in places. If we look at the um, the information sort of online, such as the uh, Geology of Britain viewer, uh, you can see information there about the height formation. There's a uh, sort of sandstone and limestone interbedded uh, units, subequal or subordinate uh, amounts of, of each. And it's obviously Cretaceous in age, and it was a sedimentary um, deposit, uh, and it was uh, deposited within shallow seas environment. In uh, trying to find uh, representative sections of the uh, Hyth Formation, it's, it's actually, as, as with a lot of areas in, around the UK, if you're not on the coast or uh, whatever, it's, it's quite difficult to actually see sections because uh, things got covered over or infilled or whatever, and quarrying is not, not as active as it used to be. And so I found that the uh, looking at the uh, BGS website, the Geoscenic Asset Bank, quite useful in picking out some uh, historical photographs of exposures in uh, former working quarries in the area. And in, and again, as you can see in this illustration, although it's black and white, the ragstone or limestone is in the light, the lighter gray sh shade, shall we say, and the hassock or the sandstone is in the, the darker shades. But you can see it's sort of um, re re reasonably regularly bedded in, in, a, in, in a way, although the thickness of individual beds vary somewhat. They're rather lenticular in nature. If we now move to look at the outcrop pattern, um, you can see from this slide, uh, looking at the sort of southeast corner, um, that, that the, the pale green colour, um, shall I try and move the cursor around it, so you, the outcrop starts at, here at, at Hive, then runs inland towards Maidstone, across to Godalming, down to Petersfield, then back out again to the coast, at, just to the north of Eastbourne. As you can see, see that arcuate outcrop, it's a variable uh, width or thickness uh, across the area and uh, I'm principally going to concentrate on the Maidstone area where you can see there's quite a quite a mass of uh, red dots indicating natural cavity or goals and fissure type locations and and where the um, the thickness of the outcrop is is a bit wider it's about 10 to 12 uh, uh, kilometers wider at this point compared with uh, many areas other areas where it's uh, narrower if we, if we then look at the um, Cross section um, through the high formation geology again taken from the the old published uh, Maidstone sheet, we can see the uh, H2B, which is the uh, high formation shown here. So as a general rule, you can see it's dipping northwards before it for uh, sort of is, is folded and then disappears underneath the um, younger deposits. Um, going northwards and pinching out. And you can also see in this section, things like in the River Len, the underlying, this slightly darker green color, which is the, um, the other field clay, is, is, uh, is, is tending to show that it's lifting up in the valley floor. And this is to do with um, uh, the, the, like a sort of uh, rise or bump of the, of the material lifting up due to periglacial weathering effects. So if we go on to the... Um, looking in plan at the um, from, from the same geology map. It's quite interesting here that we can see 
uh, that the dips arrows are really quite variable locally. So it should be dipping to the north northeast as it's a general rule, which some of these dips over here, 10 to 15, 10 degrees are showing. But you'll see locally that you've got 25 degrees into this Medway Valley floor here, 20 and 30 to the north northwest here, dips to the southeast, to the south. And in the Luce Valley here, you've got dipping northwards at 40 degrees. So it's quite variable and, and it's clear that the these um, valley floors are quite significant in terms of affecting the uh, the structure of the deposit and the way it's, uh, it's sort of dipping and uh, and the way it has moved as a result of uh, impacts due to, uh, to, to due to periglacial uh, weathering and the cambering effects. So borrowed this, this description from Lee and Giles in the, the uh, chapter four in the Geohazards uh, uh, booklet and you can see that cambering says the term describes large scale gravity driven slope deformation processes that occurred during periods of intense periglacial conditions where valleys cut through rigid cap rocks into weaker clay slash mudstone layers below. Intense freeze thaw activity causes the ductile failure of the clay or mudstone layers below the cap rocks, causing them to undergo downslope creep and to bulge upwards in the valley floor promoted by increased pore pressures as the ground ice thaws. And of course, this uh, downward movement towards the valley floors produces brittle failure of the cap rocks, producing those gills and fissures between the, uh, the blocks of rock. And this, this is kind of illustrated in this section here schematically where we can see that beyond the, the valley sides, the normal sequence of the cap rock over the, uh, the, the, the clay uh, deposit here, but then this ductile failure running down here towards the valley where the bulge is, which has now been eroded through by the river. And in doing so, it's dragged down the valley side, these uh, the cap rocks as they, uh, and in doing so, they've got this brittle failure along the major joint lines. And these zones are often filled with soft, uh, weak materials and may contain voids. And uh, and and uh, these gulls and fissures often are disguised by covers of um, uh, head deposits, which bridge across these features. And it's only when they, um, may be triggered in and, and fail over the, over the top of these features that their presence may be uh, may be revealed. Right, so this is a close up then of from looking at the the static cavities natural cavities database and you can see all green spots here are the natural cavity locations in and around the, the Maidstone area and, uh, and most of these records are of gills and fissures on the uh, on the highest formation so it's quite a lot happening in that area. Is another um, historical um, image, um, and again we can see the the, the zones where this is probably the uh, the limestone here with infilled zones where materials drop down, the, the, if you like the cracks or the, the fissures in the joints between blocks either side of it, and and partly as a result of uh, dissolution, partly as a result of cambering. And uh, this next image, again, as you can see, some of those early images taken about 1937, this one's taken from 1950, which is quite interesting in an area where at Allington, where a quarry, where the, where the overlying um, uh, sort of sand gate and Folkestone bed has been removed uh, ahead of quarrying of the, the Hythe formation. And here you can see relative to the scale, this, this guy standing here, there are these hollows formed. So presumably it's a relative in, instant rainfall, but they've produced these collapse um, uh, craters, if you like, in the surface of the Hythe formation. So it uh, shows how the, the loose nature of infills to um, uh, get caustic features and, uh, and, and sort of uh, fissure features within the, the surface of the, uh, the Hythe formation. This one for changes in uh, is, is in colour, but again you can see the, the, uh, at the top end the surface being uh, infilled with a series of these infilled solution hollows uh, across the top of the, this, this quarry face and uh, a good contrast here with the, with the orange coloured uh, materials. This next uh, historical image again dates from 1950 and what I particularly draw your eye to is this pool of water in the bottom and most definitely the, the, this uh, spring fed uh, feature here in, into this pool. And this basically is marking the interface between the, the sort of hive and the other, other field clay. And what seems to be happening is that the groundwater gathers and percolates down into the other field, uh, sorry, through the um, hive formation. It sinks to the bottom effectively and sits on top of the interface with the underlying cohesive um, other field clay formation until you, and, and, and then moves uh, along the um, preferred 
dip of that interface towards the valley floor and then will um, come to the surface as a spring where, where the erosion of the valley floor um, itself has removed the uh, the the the, the um, high formation and that interface uh, daylights at the surface. If we now look at um, actually one of the few ex idea uh, or examples of modern workings in the um, uh, the high formation, then this picture here shows the west side of uh, Maidstone in the Barming area, and you can see this uh, quarry here. There's a, a processing plant area here, and this quarry in in here uh, where the high beds are being removed. And if we go to the next shot, this is uh, again I borrowed this. So we're from, it's a shot taken by David Giles it's on the front cover of the uh, Geohazards uh, booklet, the published by the Jolsock, and you can see these uh, high beds here with these. In quite large features penetrating through the, uh, the bedrock surface where these materials have been washed down into uh, and infilling these sort of gulls and fissures in the in the in the the surface and, and as shown in the exposure there. So that gives you a flavor for sort of the the, the geology and the uh, and the setting of um, these features and how, how they're formed and what I propose now is to move on to a series of case studies which will sort of um, give some flavor to how they be how these features can be destabilized and cause some quite major problems uh, at, at the at the surface and, and uh, affect uh, both property and uh, and infrastructure so quite a few of these um, problems have, have affected um, roads and this first case study was um, is, is uh, occurs well involves actually both a road and property and the uh, this is the location of the village of Leeds to the east of um, east side of Maidstone Leeds Castle is down here for, for reference and um, the village of Leeds is on top of the hill and at this location there was a burst water main in November uh, 2013 caused a series of problems so the bottom picture here is a is a Google Street view showing the um, intersection of Milner's with Upper Street, this road here, and it's the cottages on the left here called Churchill Cottages, and the water main burst sort of occurred in this sort of area here, and this led to uh, major problems. And you can see in the aerial view the yellow line, the the water main burst here, the Churchill Cottages, and this led to a large depression that developed in this area as shown there, and you had both. Uh, damage beneath the highway, which meant it had to be closed to traffic, and also uh, structural damage uh, affecting the, um, the cottages here, which which led to a, a substance uh, uh, insurance claim of uh, affecting the properties there. And this is a series of, of photographs now taken during the course of the work. So initially, after the road was closed, the there were some excavations carried out by Kent County Council within or its, its contractor Amy within the highway here ahead of the uh, the, the works to, to try and understand what was going on uh, in, in the ground extent of voids etc and also as you can see in the front of the cottages you can see the um, porch there and that, that white door shown here in more detail is a, a large void appeared in, in front in the bank in front of this um, or beside this porch and uh, and of course, because of the damage caused, the, 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 the occupants of the cottages were um, evacuated and say the road closed and uh, caused quite a lot of um, problems to the local area because it was the only main road through this, this part of the uh, countryside. A lot of uh, back road um, diversions were then having to be put in place, etc. If we then look, um, if I go back to the previous photograph, we look, at, look in detail at this um, porch where the front door is. We're now going to look at some photographs in this area here. And the side wall, you can see this trellis is dropped down into this gaping void here. And then if you step back, you can get a, an, an appreciation of the void and the size of it up against the front door and the front wall of the cottage. And of course, damage started, crack damage started to occur, as you might imagine. And the, and at the front of these cottages um, leading to uh, uh, and they were very old cottages on very poor shallow foundations and of course there were concerns over their long term or their, their short term stability if you like uh, endangering the occupants so to try and minimize the damage that was like to be caused if the ground continued to move and and open up underneath the uh, the, the cottages that that uh, void that we saw just before was in this picture is being filled with foam concrete which is being allowed to fill it up and then uh, the idea was to set so it would it would sit on the underside of the foundations and give um, short-term uh, support to those foundations 
be, whilst, while making the area safer to allow uh, investigations to be carried out. And uh, as we can see here, the, um, this, this is a, a picture then of what's happening in the highway. So in front of the cottages where the, where the, where the road had been opened up, you can see this pipe going across as shown in here before, before it was filled with anything that you can see that the void extending beneath the, the, the side of the um, road here underneath the pavement towards the verge. And so the, the Kennedy County Highways were, were clearly not happy with that, that, that state of the stability of the ground. And they opted also to infill the voids that were revealed uh, with using uh, foam concrete as well. Um, and so and so we had to um, uh, carry out these these measures, if you like, it, preventative measures to try and sort of limit the um, extent of damage in doing the early courses of the work. And um, and because the water main had burst, and there were obviously a number of houses around without water, they they had to then put a temporary surface connection over 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 ground. To uh, to keep the supplies going to those houses that were that were that were uh, in in the local area. As you can see in this uh, next slide, the the top left here, this picture is showing the 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 extent of the foam concrete backfilled within those voids in the road, and then as you, the lower pictures you can see once that had sort of got in the way, further voids started to creep forward between the back the the filled area of in the highway and 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 within the the garden front door areas of these cottages as you can see this path is dropped and, and the wall is starting to collapse so in the end the, the the wall had to be demolished and removed um to to gain to for safety reasons and to um allow more um foam concrete to be put into those voids to uh, to, to make the area safer this uh the situation continued to evolve and as you can see as time went by this is this photograph here top right you can see on the opposite side of the road from the cottages where milner's uh, goes in from upper street on in the grass verge this this boundary wall of the house suddenly collapsed into a large hole which is shown in more detail in this photograph here and so this also coincided because this was the winter of 2013 2014 in january and february uh, 2014 it was one of those the, the, it was that winter when there was typically twice the normal rainfall for those months occurred one of the wettest winters we've known and all this water was was flowing trying to flow down the road at uh, upper street and what and wash it and find its way into the ground so a lot of sandbagging was done to try and direct water away from poles and voids to try and stop the 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 the, um, the, the, the faster deterioration of the situation but it was uh, it was actually quite difficult to um, to to control and as you can see, um, fissures started opening up. So the wall had gone, and then the then the um, the verge is gone with with more fissures opening up, despite all the foam concrete infilling that's been done to date, and 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 you can see more sections of road collapsing and moving. So it was quite a a fluid uh, situation that, uh, and, and you can see increasingly all the. Um, Pipes here for, for sort of fresh water and, and foul water all having to be over pumped and, and other connections made all within a narrow corridor of road. It was a very difficult one to, uh, to, to deal with. And as you can see here, as things, this is just an example of somebody putting a pipe and looking at the entrance between Milner's and the main road. And you can see a, a linear depression, you know, starting to uh, occur along the line of the BT services there. So with the BT manhole here in the foreground. This um, next slide just kind of acts as a sort of summary of events as, as things unraveled. And you can see that um, we have the cottages in, in the bottom of the slide here with this collapsed area of walls around the, where the porch was, extending out into the road with further features under the verge, the collapse of the boundary wall that we've mentioned. And then these other sort of, uh, sort of fissures that seem to be activated along line across the road there and and running at, a, at, a, at the angle shown there and there was increasing concern that this might continue on in this direction and go towards this property ringers and uh, would cause more structural damage fortunately number four didn't didn't wasn't uh, affected by structural damage at the time and, uh, and so as you can see a number of geophysical surveys were carried out in this area to try and understand what was what was going on the extent of voids etc Regarding the uh, the um, Churchill cottages themselves, so again, there's Milner's there. This is Upper Street again. This is the cottages looking looking north. And um, here, what was happening? We were doing exploratory holes so that the the drilling rig had to sit in the highway 
uh, to gain safe access upon the backfilled um, sort of voids and so on that was there. And we started off by doing a series of vertical holes to get to try and build up a ground model. And then, then we increasingly were drilling it ever uh, sort of a steep angle to get the holes underneath the, the front of the cottages, then a, then a slightly shallower angle to get towards the back. And so we were doing arrays of holes to try and try and get, build up a ground model. And it became evident as we went on that, that the ground was poor. There were lots of voids and, and problems in, in the ground. And so we quickly uh, moved on from doing just ground investigation holes to actually turning them both into exploratory combined with uh, grout treatment holes um, and of course quite a bit of grout was actually then um, injected into the ground in this block of, in this in this block of ground beneath the properties to stabilize them and and, uh, and, and save them from uh, further damage and uh, eventually um, also to, to show this how satisfactory the uh, tr level of treatment was a, a series of validation grout holes were were drilled as well to see that to, to demonstrate that uh, the, the, gr the grout treatment was adequate as you can see, because you're dealing with a, a relatively narrow road, a big road um, through the area, it got very congested to say the least. And so you can see in this photograph here with rigs drilling uh, vertical holes in front of the cottages, another rig over here working in Milner's trying to do work in the highway. And so it was quite tricky, although it was the same uh, drilling contractor, just trying to coordinate all the works and, and to do it as safely as possible, of course. And then in the bottom right, you can see this picture here where the um, hole is being drilled at ever shallower angles to go under the uh, the cottages, which of course the front side had to be protected against uh, you know, splashing from drilling fluids and, and grout when the grouting works was undertaken as well. Um, and this is just this this particular picture is just showing an illustration where CCTV was used in some holes where, where it, it appeared there were voids present. This was an example, one found at 15 meters uh, below the surface. And um, again, the, these tables are just sort of summarizing the, uh, the kind of grout takes which occurred. So we, we drilled effectively 30, 39 grout holes and um, you know, nearly 1100 meters of drilling uh, and the 185 uh, tons of grout was injected. And, and a lot of the holes were up to 30 meters deep. So we were using the, um, the interface with the underlying other field clay as a, as a reference point to, to understand the ground model. And um, a number of the early holes done were cored just to be sure of, of what the profiles were looking like. And you can see here with the sandstone going to limestone, limestone grading into sandstone, so typical of the core within the, the highest formation. And then this next slide then showing typ typical um, sort of uh, zones where you've got broken rock and here where we might have voids and lost material uh, during the, the coring process due to the uh, the the, ext the um, features extending down through the through the ground profile, and uh, I think this is the final slide for this case study. And and you can see we were actually looking finding that the the below the the um, the head deposits of the surface that the the profile of bedrock obviously showed a, a local lowering, uh, almost crater like in the top, um, where where the original collapse uh, occurred. And, and as we went down to the profile, we found other significant voided zones at depth and even right to the bottom. So it seems like we have groundwater and, and a sloping interface here. So with groundwater would have been traveling through this area and probably producing karstic weathering in the limestone bands through here with the voids found in the, in the middle and bottom. And then f further opening up of, of um, fissures and, and joints in this area with the gulls and fissures features. And it, we also found that in a 3D way, the, these, these, some of these features would, uh, ex would extend so far vertically, then step to one side along another joint, perhaps uh, sub-parallel sub with, with the bedding direction, and then step down again. So it was a bit staircase-like uh, in the way some of it worked. So it was quite a complex uh, 3D shape to, to sort of understand where all the voids and the problems were in, in carrying out the treatment that we did. But uh, it was successful in the end. Now moving on to the second case study. Um, this one is, um, as it says there, the location here of a ground uh, substance affecting a road on the A, which is the A277, uh, south of Item near Plaxtall, uh, Kent. You can see the road uh, shown there. And uh, this is a uh, obviously a shot of the, the collapse of the the highway. So it's a fairly significant uh, hole taking out more than the uh, single carriageway, as you can see. And this 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 work uh, or this uh, collapse occurred in January 2015. 
and uh, again it follows a, a water main leak on the, in, in affecting the road and uh, so taken from the other side of the hole this is where you, you can see the verge and all the uh, vegetation trees has slid into the hole and uh, and, and so caused quite a quite a sizable uh, mass of, of moving ground as you can see there um so in all, so this was eventually sort of cleared out and you can see a machine has got in there and they're sort of pecking away to try and trim back the sides to 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 expose the area that's uh, affected so that further investigations could be uh, carried out and uh, this is a section looking along the axis of the road uh, uphill and you can see that at the top there where we've got a, uh, the asphalt and the sub-base layer above a head and increasing thickness of brick earth and you can see down the side these layers are draped down over the glauconitic sand which is the height formation in situ and so you can see this is going into a, a, a gold fissure type feature which is running in this sort of direction with the collapse zone shown in the foreground there and of course here is the uh, the broken water main up here on the right hand side and uh, if we then look side on to that uh, you, you can see as a four meter deep section, we've we've got the glauconitic sands of the of the high formation revealed there with just an, a gravel layer ab above, which uh, contrasts with the, the section at this end of the in the in the road axis itself. And now the uh, good couple of slides now showing a series of um, uh, progress photographs, I suppose you could say, while while various repairs and investigations were being done, and and uh, the idea was that beyond the collapse zone, some, some, some probing was carried out north of the collapse to see whether, see whether there was um, problems of voids and, and other disturbance of the ground extending uh, beyond the collapse, main collapse zone. While it was decided to carry out effectively an excavation and replacement exercise, and so the, the whole collapse area was, was, was sort of dug out to try and reveal um, competent rock um, and, and around the edges and fringes of the, of the collapse zone, and that was partly dug out as well. And then they were doing uh, then backfilling with the uh, rock rock fill, as, sh as is shown here. And then above that, they were putting in a layer of the uh, foam concrete, which is then allowed to set on top of that to create a, a firm base. Upon that, there was further capping and sub base over the foam concrete. And um, and, and also, was uh, uh, there was um, some other rotary, yes, yeah, some, some other rotary drilling was also carried out um, um, in parallel with some of this, these other works as, as they then put in the road sort of capping and sub base and were, were sort of uh, carrying out the remedial repairs. And as you can see at the, uh, the, on the bottom left, the void filling is then almost complete, and on the bottom right, the the new road surface has been uh, been created. And uh, and then and then reopened. So this is again a plan view showing the uh, the, the road along this this line here. This was the original uh, collapse area where the, the verge sort of was uh, fell into the the, the whole large hole that uh, was created, and you can see the ex the expository hole uh, positions here with the uh, rotor drilling and the uh, the dynamic probes. And uh, is a cross section through it, so that's the collapse. Um, so this is the rotary drill hole through there, going down. Found reasonably competent ground to one side of that collapse, looking okay. Except in the upper portion, as you can see from the probing, the um, th there were some better, more competent zones at this lower level, the red zone, uh, a bit weaker in the yellow, but the weakest was in, in the the upper surface zone up here. But of course, that was then part of the uh, the area part, partly sort of dug out and written replaced of course and and, uh, and another hole that was done further away found interestingly uh, a more competent profile but still came out still found in some voids as you can see here and there within the profile but that i guess was was accepted that that was the nature of the geological sequence in the in the in the area and was beyond the zone that was affected Now we're going to go and have a look at a, a, another case study, number three, um, and this uh, again occurred in uh, probably a, a very inconvenient uh, location, um, uh, where the it was in fact, it was called the 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 A twenty six Tunbridge Road. You can see it's the uh, one of the major roads coming out west out of Maidstone through through Barming, uh, and you have this uh, intersection here with this B road going north, 
and the collapse occurred at the traffic light junction. And you can see in the next uh, picture, um, here we are, the road has been closed off for obvious reasons to the danger to traffic. So we've got two lanes going west with the right hand turn in the middle lane. And this is the eastbound uh, carriageway. And this is a road that normally carries, you know, tens of thousands of vehicle movements per day. And this terrace of houses, because of the uh, holes were eventually uh, sort of evacuated while uh, investigations were carried out in this general area to see what was happening. And the businesses on this side were, were, were closed as well temporarily. So this collapse occurred on the bank holiday weekend. <laughs> I'm sure the uh, Harris Authority were very pleased about that on the 20th of May 2018. And uh, this is a, 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 a plan view. So this is the B road here. This is the A26 running this direction, northeast, southwest. And the original collapse is within this sort of zone here that we saw on the other photograph. And um, what they found was they, they, they did some further excavations um, following a mixture of geophysics and doing probing. And, the, um, uh, and they found a void under here, which is a significant size void underground beneath, immediately below the road surface, um, which was uh, along the line of the sewer. And there was also another void under the uh, the edge of the leading to the bus bay under the, the verge here as well. Um, and you can see where a series of poor results adjacent to that and along here were found as a result of um, of, of loose layers found by dynamic, dynamic probing as well. So uh, it, was, it was again a fairly extensive area of, of, of uh, affected by the, the movement, not just the original collapse, but quite a few surrounding features as well. This is a slightly poor quality aerial view, but you can see the things that were going on at the time. You can see where the road was closed, being, being closed off and, and up here as well. And in the middle, this is the original collapse zone. This is the larger hole that was found or larger void found under the road prior to collapse, and uh, which was to do the, um, the foul water main. And, um, and here we had some, you can see some New, there was a problem here with uh, water supply to these properties the way they were doing repairs to the water main as well following leaks and, and problems and this is the area where the uh, void is found to do with the the uh, surface water drain for, under the road as well so a whole series of things all happening inputting water to this area and um, but principally probably the leaking um, sewer uh, cause, causing the uh, collapse that occurred in this this area and uh, I don't expect to read all this, but it, but effectively, it's just it's just acting as a sort of summary of of events, really. That you know they had to get their act together very quickly on a bank holiday weekend, uh, as as a major road collapse occurred, shutting the road, and that um, early investigations identified numerous voids and extensive soft spots, and uh, and so they ended up um, carrying out ground stabilisation using compaction grouting through July up into mid August. Uh, which used 1,000 and odd uh, metric tons of grout down to 11 meters under the road level. And as it says, working in an area not much bigger than a, than a tennis court. So it's uh, quite, quite, quite tricky uh, conditions. And then by the beginning of September, once the ground stabilization was completed, the main line sewer had been reinstalled. Uh, and then, then they had the final phase was, was putting back each of the layers, sort of utility by utility, layer by layer, to put to reinstate the road surface. And then, which it, that was eventually opened again on the uh, weekend of the 20th, 21st of October. And so, again, the incident duration then was 22 weeks. Cost, were, were, costs for doing this were over a million pounds. And um, a lot of you know, stone, asphalt, grout materials, et cetera, et cetera, were, were used in, in the process to, uh, to pull this all together and, and to uh, re remediate the, uh, the, the problems and put the road back in action again. So when, when things go wrong, clearly uh, it doesn't know it's happening in very convenient locations. And uh, this, this next case study is uh, case study four, um, is, is, is really uh, uh, one which is again to the, uh, to the west side of Maidstone. And you'll notice that the last case study, uh, if I just flick back up, is on the same map so you can see it's at the intersection of that b road and the a road there causing that hole and if i flip back through on the map here you can see this this next case study is literally so the last one was there and this one is just just in um relatively new newer housing uh in this area here so it's not not too far away really 
and so quite a few problems occurring in and around this this sort of this side of Reading uh, or the side of uh, Maidstone rather in, in these in these sort of areas. So the, the property is called Thunham House, and the collapse we're going to have a look at occurred in the uh, say 26 November 2020. So we're getting more more recent, and um, you can see the here we've got sort of buildings. Um, either side with a sort of gap in the middle with with sort of uh, so garages and parking and so on in here and you, you can obviously be see there's a disturbance to the surface here which uh, collapsed into the ground so if we go and look at that in a bit more detail you can see there's quite a bit of distortion here all the brick pavers have dropped away so it's quite a while and you can see it's sort of narrowing that end and widening to the right but you can see there's quite a lot of um, collapsed uh, zone in front and there was a there's a there's a bit of movement on the, the front of these and towards the, the side here as well so it became a uh, subject of a substance insurance claim and uh, and so further works were were done to try and understand the extent of the problem and what might be done to stabilize the situation and make it safe for the uh, the, the buildings etc around there this is a further close up of that um, if you like the, the so-called narrow end of that uh, collapse in front of the, uh, the structure here and you can see you know open voids going going down there so and obviously is a utility passing through there so it's 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 quite a quite a serious amount of material has been lost if you like into the ground sort of washed into the ground uh, by as a, as a result of sort of problems that have occurred there in order to define the problems in a bit more detail uh, it was decided to um, sort of take, to, if you like, use the access that were between the buildings there and uh, put a series or a grid of uh, dynamic probes, the DPs, across the area, just using this kind of rig as shown here. And also um, to carry out window sample boreholes, as shown there, series of boreholes in around the main collapse zone to understand uh, what some of the profiles look like. Um, it was accepted, obviously, that. You, you, there might be limitations on the amount of penetration you might get with the probes and or the window sample boreholes, but where the wick ground was weak in filling, uh, perhaps a gill fissure type feature, then obviously you're going to get reasonable uh, depth of um, penetration, and, uh, and and therefore we could have a look, look at the profile in in a bit more detail. So that that's that was the sort of plan uh, set out there of of the exploratory holes. Uh, and then in this next uh, slide, you can begin to see that having got the results from those holes, um, we, we then uh, carried out uh, analysis of, of the features and effectively it was felt that there were th three main zones. So you got quite a large zone here, number one, centered on the, um, the collapse zone itself. There appeared to be a feature just beyond the edge developed and another feature down here. So just within that one, you know, between the two buildings, just in a relatively limited area, fairly, fairly tight access, we've got, we've got a series of features all in close proximity uh, to each other, causing, uh, causing problems. And so in order to understand it better, the idea was to put the, we put the data into uh, LeapFrog software so that we could actually um, look, look at the, look at the information in a bit more uh, detail. And if I go back to the former slide, you can see this is just to explain where that line was. So that's DPO2 there running along the center line pretty much is, is where we're now looking. So I think it's DPO2, three. So, so here we've got a feature at this, this southern end or the one end going through the middle. And then well, this is sort of the collapse zone and going up to the north side uh, or the, we'll, we'll call it north and uh, on, on this, uh, off to the right hand side of this, uh, this image. So you can see that the uh, the software is 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 good for for visualizing, if you like, the um, the problems in the ground there to to help uh, understand the nature of the problem and the extent of the problem, and then therefore evaluate the um, the solutions that might be applied. Here we've got another, and it's just a bit different, different variation, I suppose, the cross section through the ground condition, showing the relative strength of the ground profile, and uh, you can see the weakest ground. Uh, is obviously where it's red, uh, but these are in 300 values going from zero, is, if you like, red, to blue, which is you know, 15 and greater. And so this, this helped to um, visualize this uh, 
So this would have been the equivalent of, if I just flick through again, so it would have been two is that feature there. Number one in the middle with three beyond. So if I come back to that again, so that's the one that the born in the middle, and that's the one three at the, the other end. So you, you can see how it was visualized by analyzing the, um, the, the density of the, of the ground or the relative density of the ground as, as, as uh, determined from the dynamic probing uh, results. And this is the kind of uh, profile that we were getting. Um, and, and you can see the collapse in this above this zone here. So we got some very poor results. And, and ability to, for migration of materials into poor zones here. Whereas we then have obviously a regular, more competent sort of bedrock sitting between here. Uh, although there is a, a link down in the, into this feature here, but this at the bottom end seems to be um, quite separate in nature from the, the other features that are happening over here is definitely a bigger, bigger sort of um, uh, gap, if you like, between, between those features, relatively speaking. And um, Here's a shot of the, it was decided basically to stabilize the grain because of the um, depth range. It, was, it wasn't feasible, to, for example, to simply sort of dig it out and replace or anything like that. So it was decided to um, grout the, uh, the, the features there with compaction grouting uh, through these sort of weakened zones. And um, here's a picture of the grouting rig in place. <coughs> and here you can see the um, the, the hose extending from the uh, the sort of mixing uh, pumping unit in the in, out just out of sight in the foreground, extending this way to the rig before it's then pumped down into the uh, the hole under pressure. And uh, just in pass, you can see the type of um, mix that the um, compaction grout mix is here. This is the grout slump test. As you can see, it's a very uh, stiff, viscous mortar-like um, grout mix. So that it's 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 created within this um, uh, slump test vessel here, and then when they take that away, you can see the shape it more or less is ma maintained. It's slumped a little bit, but it's uh, pretty much the same shape. And the difference in in height there is it, it gives you the uh, the, sl the slump test uh, results. And in the background, of course, uh, materials uh, have been taken for uh, batch samples, ready for laboratory cube strength cube testing as well. So this is a uh, summary of the the sort of grouting results that was uh, achieved through this uh, through this zone. Remember, they had the uh, collapse zone in sort of through this area here, and you can see that uh, green indicates uh, low grout takes. So this got a good edge there, and through this zone here, and red is is high. So although we got some high here, we, it was decided not to pursue this in because this other feature at the bottom end here, which is definitely shown by the modeling to be separate from this area so so that was that was not uh, uh, further evaluated by grouting and just enough to give uh, support to the the immediate area of the side and and in this zone we're concentrated here by doing more more um more, more, more grouting and and carrying out validation uh, grouting as well so you can see uh, the the line of the fissure crossing this area with the high grout takes as indicated by the red uh, colors here and in this uh, shot you can see the same uh, layout again but shown here now with the validation grout takes and so you can see that um by but when when these holes were then drilled and attempt to be grouted again they only took very low amounts of grout um which which then confirmed that the um grouting results uh, were, were were adequate and, and the level of the level of treatment was suitable uh, and satisfactory so uh, that's that's what was carried out there um also we there was some cases we we also did some validation probing as well which are the vp uh holes which do compare the um the strength of the grain before and after treatment so again there's there's another check on the on the process that's been carried out uh, here is a summary table of the uh, of the ground stabilization progress, and you can see um, here that you can see how many holes have been carried out, including the validation ground holes, and that uh, you can see the, that in the initial treatment, some of the early holes done have got some very high ground takes. These are in tons, so some of these are you know nearly 110 tons. One down here, 284 tons. 
nearly 121 tonnes, some really quite significant tonnage takes in individual holes, and just shows the, the three shapes of these, of these features, the way they can connect and carry ground, uh, grout down into the ground and, and, and uh, below the surface to uh, uh, in, in, in the way the, the, the 3D connection works. And then, as you can see, where, when you pull out of the features, we went into categories with, with very low grout takes. And obviously at the bottom, you can see when the validation grouting was carried out, we got very low takes, confirming that the, uh, the level of treatment had been successful. So uh, that's, the, that's those results. And um, at the end of the day, uh, they, over, the, over the period the work's carried out, we've had, we, they actually had 34 holes grouted. Of the total amount of grout placed was um, not, not far off 800 uh, tonnes, so quite a considerable amount of material put into the ground in, in a relatively small area, but it just shows you the extent of these features and the way they work in, in 3D and their interconnectivity with sort of um, voids in, in, in the bedrock and, um, and how difficult it is to, to treat them without trying to seal them up but, and, and um, and, re and strengthen the, the infills by, by the addition and injection of, of the growth materials, really. And then just to finish, I've got just, just briefly going to talk about, well, I call it case study five, but um, in reality, it's, um, it's not so much a substance case study, but um, some information that's sort of come uh, to, to me uh, from, a, from a project that's uh, currently underway. And, and it's a, a for, a, for a development that's to the east of Maidstone and some interesting results that have been um, found uh, by carrying out an archaeological um, investigation of the site ahead of the main geotechnical investigation. And when it was suddenly realized that uh, quite a lot of geological features had been found as a result uh, of, the, of, that, of those archaeological works, clearly the archaeologists went in assuming that these were all archaeological features but soon realized that in fact they were picking up geological features rather than archaeology um, and and i think it's uh, it's kind of intriguing is that it's i think they carried a magnetometer survey so what they're sense what they're sensing or what the survey is sensed here is actually uh, the yellow lines represent you see the pattern the yellow lines running across here and, and up here it, uh, are picking up are, are being sensitive to clay and fills Long linear, long lineaments in the bedrock surface of the highest formation, and so this this kind of pattern that we see is is really showing the density and complexity of the of the of the infilling of these, these gulls and fissures in the surface of the highest formation, and so here we've got a, a lot a lot running from sort of you know left to right, and then and then and then up up and down in this direction as well, and crisscrossing uh, in places as well. So you, you've got a, it, it's. Um, it's, it's somehow the I think the, the probably the depth to these bedrock is just about right for this the magnetometer to pick up the um, the contrast with the fills which are daylighting through the top surface of the bedrock, and so it's it's an, so it's incredibly um, uh, detailed plan that you're seeing here of the complexity of these of, of how these features look like it uh, like and also if you imagine trying to build on top of this how close some of these features are, uh, so it's so it's it's quite and and so therefore you'd start to sort of question it probably from a development point of view, whether you can actually literally uh, kind of want to go in and investigate and find individual features. So clearly there are too many of them. It would be far too expensive to do that. And you've probably got to move to more, um, more, more a system of, of understanding what the kind of ground conditions are present there and how you might deal with that in terms of perhaps coming up with a model of perhaps saying well foundations need to be able to cope with a certain loss of ground support maybe three meters for example and and that uh, reinforced uh, you know ground beams or raft or something like that might be appropriate in these in these scenarios but it's also tricky therefore for the drainage design not to want to trigger any of these features off to cause uh, holes in particular places so a, a, bi a big challenge really to um, both uh, structures and infrastructure really in trying to develop uh, such such areas and just to prove that these are or were uh, uh, features uh, within the bedrock surface. The uh, there's just this slide, another one that follows, which is the this is the archaeological record of the section through the gull, and you can see here that the limestone bedrock is on this edge, and this edge on the left, and down the bottom here as well. You can see this is this is the um, it says stone finds that but actually this is probably in situ as well, just sandstone, so it's limestone becoming more sandstone orientated or, or, or uh, 
down here and you can see the kind of wedge shape of this material running down here and this way that's forming almost like a sag synclinal with a uh, bedding with it with a collapse through the middle with this um clay lens running down vertically where material has been uh, clearly, clearly in geological time has, has, has descended and, and collapsed and fallen into this feature, which has then been planed across the top, uh, showing just relatively flat ground. And, and yet, it, yet the, the 3D structure that's sitting just below the surface is, uh, is, is quite surprising, really. Uh, you've got a couple of meters, you've got a few meters uh, section here. And in this uh, final slide, this this is showing the so it would be great if if, we, if, if geotechnical budgets uh, stretch to allowing us to uh, carry out trial pits in in this sort of level of detail. But you can see where the ground has been scraped to look at the surface um, as part of the the archaeological investigations, and then because they found this this infilling and discolored zone this, with the glauconite in in here, they've decided to then open up this section here and the lower one, which is shown on the previous slide um, schematically and you can see the the extent of the uh, the bedrock so this here's the limestone bedrock here and here and, and this is the bottom end of the sandstone coming in in this area here so you've got limestone so with the sandstone in here but here you can see the 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 the, uh, the, the shape of these features draped down into the into the bedrock surface with, with, with the axis running in this sort of direction and uh, and and the, and the and these and the different colours, you know, emphasise the 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 nature of the the draping of these features and, and how they've settled in, and subsided into this feature over in geological time, and uh, and yet when you start looking at the surface over here, it's it's kind of flat and there's not much to give it away that that this this amount of uh, of um, 3D geological feature is just sitting uh, below the surface, quite quite amazing really. Um, so there we go. If only, if only we had the budgets to uh, carry it trial pitting to see this this degree of detail. Uh, but we can at least thank the archaeology for uh, coming up with it with a, with a really good detailed uh, geotechnical picture in this case. So with that, uh, that's the end of my talk, and thank you all for listening. Thanks, Matt. That was really fascinating in terms of the damage done from those voids and sort of the level of investigation you need to do, as well as then the sort of Got any questions, could you put them in the chat and we can work through them. Um, I, I had a quick question myself actually, uh, Clive, in terms of just sort of the, the sheer volume of material you need to use. How often do you get the estimate of how much material you need to backfill everything? Is too much or too little? <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's it, it's a it's a tricky one because the um, on on one way people well one option is to is to, is to try I think the key thing probably is to try and um, try and make the the, ge the geological model as accurate as possible to start with so you have an idea of the sh sheer physical size of the feature hence the need to grid these things when you when you when you're investigating them it's, it's another thing to start demarcating elements where one bit might you think that probably doesn't need treatment but this other area does there's that kind of uh, interpretation and consideration as well but then when it comes to percentage of takes sometimes you don't know quite how it's going to work 3d so in, in terms of the interconnectivity to get the to be sure of going to get the level of stabilization you want so you you could you can work up i mean it's possible to say to clients well it could be 10 percent or 15 percent by volume you know the great take of this ground but but you'd always have to have the uh, the, the, the caveat that, however, <laughs> it could connect into something more extensive, and we'll just have to see how the how the ground behaves when you when you treat it, because it's a self proving exercise, and and uh, you know it, 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 the end result will be what it what it will be really. Um, we're getting some questions coming through now. Um, okay. The first one on the list is from George and Heather. It says, question one, what pressure is used for the grouting and how do you decide what pressure to use? And then there's a second question after that, which is, does this formation reach to the Biggin Hill area? Right. Um, well, in terms of um, pressures, typically the applied pressure is about one bar per meter of overburden thickness. Um, and what you're trying to do basically is, is, is not actually lift the ground, 
you're trying to inject it at sufficiently high pressure to compress it and consolidate the ground uh, to improve its strength. So it's best applied to more granular materials or composite materials that have a granular content for entirely, for, for, for where you get materials with, with a significant percentage of clay, then probably the, the outcome can be more variable. But again, you need to, you know, it, it, one has to check by doing, uh, carrying out, uh, uh, should we say, treatment and then checking with the, with the validation process at the end as to what's, what's actually feasible and possible. Um, so, and and therefore um, that, that so that that's the basis of it and, and so also the pressure is being uh, at the point, injection point is being is, is being measured in line at the top of the casing when the when the grout is uh, injected into the ground and so you, and so initially when you push in with high pressure the ground will just simply sort of crumple and and, and will be um, um, consolidated as as the pressure bulb moves out into the ground and what you're waiting for is the point at which the ground starts to resist that and then starts to um, uh, give an elastic reaction, I suppose, to, to that, that injection, and you start to see the, the pressure rise, and then they just cut off the pressure and stop, and the, and the injection is completed at that point. And then you'd, you, so if that was, let's say, between, for example, say, between 10 meters and eight meters depth, then you'd, then you'd lift the casing and do the next injection, perhaps between eight meters and six meters depth. And so you're kind of doing it in, you know, lifts of a couple of meters or something like that at a time. It could be a meter, two meters, three meters lifts at a time, depending on what the contractor is going to do with his technique and depending on his method statement so, and, the, and the equipment that's being used. So it's that kind of process that is, uh, that is, that is happening. And we've got one from Andrew Nisloning who says, in case study one, what does NQP stand for, please? Okay. NQP. Uh, sorry, can I just I have to go back to that? <laughs> case study one. Do, do we know which? Uh... <laughs> <That's> good. <laughs> do we know which slide it was on? Right that one. Is it one of these? Um, Angela, if you want to unmute your mic, um, we could could help Clive if you can remember what slide it was. Yes, hi. It was oh, the actually. last. <laughs> Last slide for case study two, I think it was. Oh, you've got it there. The software. Yeah, I've just, I've just realized. Yes, it just says. Uh... Thank you. Yeah, soft. Thank you. I have to be honest, I can't remember what that is. But it, it would have been because that's the. This would have been. It's, it's, it's the the way it was evaluated was depending on the uh, drilling. So I should have said the, um, the 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 way the the drilling was done. It was kind of instrumented as 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 was done. Uh, in this case, it was kind of manually inst instrumented in the sense that the drillers were recording the time taken to penetrate on at half meter intervals. So they so we we then used that as a system to um, uh, evaluate whether whether it was a, a, a quick a quick sort of penetration of like say 20 seconds or something like that to go half a meter or whether it was taking five minutes so you, it was whether it's hard or soft and so it would it would i can't remember exactly what the nqp itself stands for but i i suspect it's something to do with penetration so it's probably less than it might have been i'm guessing it's less than 30 seconds and uh, and that's to do with the softness of the ground depending on the penetration rate achieved hope that helps um, and then we're getting lots of questions. I hope we've got time. <laughs> I was very interested, which Ian says, very interesting talk. Thank you. It's the first example that in the first example, there was an indication of movement of the Allerfield clay, which was then eroded. Is the movement in Allerfield clay still a cause of instability? Um, so far as I can, I can make out the Allerfield clay itself appears to be, if you like, in the current geological conditions, quite or appears to be relatively 
competent and okay. And it, it, it itself is not um, moving, but I would say probably like a lot of periglacial areas in, um, or periglacially weathered affected areas, I'm sure it must contain um, shear surfaces. And so there may be certain circumstances where uh, if, if, that, if that material was exposed and, and water was to, to be able to sort of penetrate down through maybe fissures or whatever in that, in that material and intersect such um, remnant shears within, within the material, then, then it might possibly um, be not so good from a, for a, perhaps a slope stability point of view. And there's another question from George and Heather. It says, when was the problems you described first known about? Uh, well, well, the problems, I mean, the, the, the examples I've shown, I think from about 2013 onwards, um, but in terms of the, I, I think, I mean, the way they manifested themselves in most cases, they were as a result of leaking, leaking utilities. And so, uh, for example, the, the first case study, which happens to be on, yeah, on, on the screen at the moment, if we go back to the, um, oops, the, this area, there was a, a, wa a water main um, had, had been uh, ran down here as the, 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 clean, the clean water being, it was the water supply to these cottages and the water main ran down the road here. And there was a period of probably of a few months over, over, over which um, the water company was back and forth trying to find what they thought was possibly a leak in the area, but couldn't actually find it, but were kind of aware that water was disappearing somewhere because I think there were water supply pressure problems in, in some of these properties and they lost suppliers intermittently. And, and sometimes I think they had water running down the surface of the road. So, so it, 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 it's kind of the, the telltale signs, if you like, prior to this, this quite sizable collapse was probably running for at least a, you know, a, a month, you know, several weeks anyway, in, in advance of it actually finally uh, um, manifesting itself in, in the way of a, a major collapse at the surface. Down to Stephen Harris's question. Was the pipework damaged because of the ground movement or did it leak and contribute to the collapse? If the leak contributed, did the utility owner contribute? Yes, chicken and egg. <laughs> um, in, in, this, in this particular instance, um, the, it was determined that the, that the, water, that the water supply pipe um, there were signs of, I think, damage to the pipe that it, I can't remember, it was, uh, I think, not sure it was, uh, it was from a corrosion point of view, but they were leaking joints, something was not right with it. And so water leaked from the pipe into the ground, which triggered the ground movement. So it was determined that the water company, effectively the owner of the pipe, um, was, was, the was, was the principal agent uh, for, for causing the damage. And so ultimately the, um, yes, it was subject to a legal case and, um, but the, the water authority picked up the bill, the water company picked up the bill. Morgan's well, got another water company pipe question, which is with portal waste water pipes being a, a trigger in most of your case studies, are the local water companies becoming more involved? Um, I'd, I'd say um, it seems to me that asset management is probably an important thing really for, for water utilities. My experience, though, is that um, water companies have a rather mixed record over, over taking active involvement in, in, the, in their asset management. What I think, I, I think in many cases, obviously, pipes will, will cross all, so all manner of geological, you know, dip, if you like, um, incompetent and competent ground in, in, in different parts of the country. And, and, they're, and, and they're obviously, they're, they're not carrying outside investigations to define what ground, what type of ground their pipes cross. Probably, probably they get more information where you have contaminated land sites than, than otherwise. But um, in terms of types of materials, they might have make their pipes of, et cetera, for connections. But, the, um, but in terms of instability, then I, I think it's, it's, it's more tricky. And um, you, you think in some ways they might be interested in, in sort of um, areas which could be perhaps you know, geohazard mapped perhaps to, to highlight certain types of things. But um, I'd say if anything, that that's probably in its infancy really uh, at this stage in at this, this point in time.
I'm assuming that Vicky has, has disappeared. Oh, I think it's, yeah, I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> I was waiting on silence then. <laughs> yeah. Uh, ironically, the next question on the list is from me. Oh, right. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, so my question, Clive, is, is there any insight from your database on whether the frequency of grown failures is changing? Yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, I, I think in some ways the, the numbers and magnitude of damage is, is I mean, a, a personal view on, on look, rather than something, uh, well, I suppose I have done it for the chalk. I've done uh, some of the chalk outcrop uh, analysis and looking at sinkholes there and so on. I think there are links to possibly to climate change in the sense of more heavy downpours and more great, greater intensity of, of rainfall. Um, so there is that uh, g going on, I think, in passing. Um, and and it, it seems to me that the the magnitude of some of the damages caused by some of these events is is almost in, has has to some extent increased over time, but but maybe it's also partly a function because we we have more dense um, sort of developments if you know what I mean. So the so the places when they, when they build the kind of you know, closer and immediately adjacent or or whatever to to sort of utility lines and that kind of thing, and you start wondering about the resilience of things the way they're built. I guess that my, my follow-on question was going to be: uh, what, 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 what's the sort of? Uh, is there much thought then about the, the, the impact of climate change, changing intensity of rainfall, the sort of things that water companies are doing to assess impact on on sewer surcharge? Is, is there anything in the in the uh, uh, geotechnical industry or the ground engineering industry that's, that's thinking about it in the same way to understand that that sort of increased risk in the future from a climate change perspective? Yeah, I think I think it's. Um, I can only say my, my personal experience, having engaged an, a few conversations, shall we say, with asset managers with, with asset managers in in water companies, it's been met with rather mixed reactions. And uh, whilst I might like to think that they they might like to be more interested in what I'm interested in, because it might it might uh, limit their damages and therefore the cost of damages. Mm, yes, yes. You know what I mean? You'd think there would be a mutual interest there. Yeah. Um, then then it, it doesn't always seem to be working out quite like that. But mm. but the more it costs them, I suppose, you know, some of these cases are quite expensive where you start hitting a million pounds or something like that. Mm. It must be affecting them uh, financially. Yeah. I'm assuming that Vicky uh, is, is still uh, offline. So, so the, the next question, uh, is from Edward Cox, who's a near surface uh, geophysicist at Atkins. And he says it's great to see that geophysics has been used to solve problems like this. The case study finds a fantastic example of how powerful a tool it is to resolve issues in the ground. So, so his question is Is geophysics often the first tool suggested to resolve where voids might be, and then the results used to target intrusive works? Yeah, I think um, there are probably uh, my experience has always been there's, there's some people in the industry <laughs> perhaps don't quite don't they don't entirely uh, like geophysics or, or uh, have, have a have a, a lot of perhaps a cynical view of, of the value of, of geophysics personally I've always thought geophysics is a, is a base a powerful tool and useful tool and probably my experience has been that in the majority of cases it's the results have proved useful rather than 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 than, than not useful at all shall we say and so therefore I, I've, I've often tended to um, advise clients to carry out uh, reconnaissance um, sort of geophysical surveys at, 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 at crossing sites where we're trying to look at uh, geohazard problems once we know it's got a sufficiently high rating that's worth wanting to know a bit more about the spatial distribution of those geohazards like voids and or loose ground zones or whatever, then um, I, I think it does have a useful role to play. And I think where you have the chance then of picking up some, as he, as he says, some some sort of um, targets as a result, which might be picked up by the geophysical survey, at least it gives you some, um, it improves your statistical chance, I think, of, 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 of targeting GI to, to understand the characteristics of the underlying geohazard in the ground. Uh, because otherwise, if you if you if you take the standard GI approach and did did a sprinkling of boreholes across the site, if you got no other guide, then statistically, or you you could so very easily just miss everything, and 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 come away with no no inkling as to the, the scale and size of, of the geohazards below the surface. 
um, because there's no visual of the visual guide, should we say, it's like a, like a depression in the surface or whatever from the walkover survey to, to guide you otherwise. Uh, we've, got a, we've got a few more questions. Uh, there's, there's probably there's probably four questions but uh, that we should take, uh, but then we'll probably uh, stop. But the first question is actually a four-part question. So, so uh, hold on to your hats. So it's from Karizanis Kiriaku. Uh, and the first question is why foam concrete was used to fill in the voids? Okay, the, the, the use for foam concrete is it, because it's an aerated lightweight concrete, what you're trying to do is, is kind of fill a void with something that will set, but has low, low weight. So it's, it's, got, it's got a reasonable strength, uh, but it's got low weight. So you, because you don't want to try and do trigger anything by overloading an already weak or voided uh, piece of ground. So it's a way of giving some, some positive support and, 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 um, and, and taking up the void space to stop the damage spreading. Because very often, if you get a collapse at the surface, what tends to happen is they all it, it tends to ravel radially outwards and then undercuts more and more of the building and putting more and more at risk. So by by doing that, you kind of stabilize the situation with something that's lightweight and 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 relatively solid, if you like, to to sort of take up the space and provide some support and, and so in a passive way. And then, and if and if at the end of the day you don't want it as, as as part of your permanent works, you can excavate it and remove it. So it, it has some other advantages there as well. So, so just going on with, with uh, uh, question number two. Uh, so regarding the injection pressures, uh, I, what, the question is, was it a case that an increase in pressure created a greater flow as it opened up another void further below? Um, yeah, I take the point. The, I think, you, I suppose you could never say that you that you can't that you can't be certain that that you don't open up some interconnectivity, but I think that's why you need to have done sufficient um, prior investigation of the ground to get your ground model together to understand what the three D shape of what's of the audio has it in if you like in in the ground what it looks like and how it, and how best it it has, what its three D shape is like. So I think you need to, it's, it's a case of trying to understand that that below ground relationship in three D so that you can best understand whether you're going to, if you like, force grout in, into, a, into, a, into a one zone, into another zone, or, or what the what relationship is between different, different um, hazardous portions of, grout, of the ground conditions, really. And just staying with the grout itself, um, how, how was the grout mix chosen? Um, the, um, well, I suppose the compaction grout mix has got a very good track record in this country. I, I, but I'm personally, I've been probably using compaction grouting with a number of different companies uh, doing the injections and treatment, probably since about the late 1980s. And um, so it's got a good track record in this country of, of, of uh, strengthening um, sort of vo voided and or very loose, weak ground associated with the infills to geohazards, uh, whether it's, you know, solution cavities or gills and fissures or whatever it might be, and, and some of the mining uh, related issues as well. So it, it, it has it has a particular ro role for this idea of treatment and, and in strengthening the ground and I say it's got a good track record. And and therefore, I suppose that has encouraged its continued use, uh, you know, by, by industry through time, really. And, and therefore, the, the reason why the mixture is chosen the way it is is obviously you you want something that's very stiff ground. You don't want a, a you don't want a, a very fluid ground if you're going to strengthen the ground. You, fluid ground is for for bulk filling, and when you want to want to push the ground into sort of reaches that you know you you injected one point and wanted to flow to another point, but if you do compaction grouting, you're trying to keep the ground local to the point of injection, so it's a rather different application. Oh, sorry. Uh, you probably didn't hear me then, because I didn't get <laughs> off mute. Ah. Oh, right. I can say a bit of silence then. <laughs> yeah, sorry. You thought I'd gone as well. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, the, the last part of uh, Karizanis' question was, uh, was about uh, case study four. The adjacent building appears to be relatively new. 
Uh, does mm. that mean the features were developed after construction of the building? Yeah, well, well, the, the, the features in the ground predated the building by a long way because they were you know, developed in geological time. Um, I would I would say that in that instance, the the geotechnical advisor to the uh, developer, I suppose, possibly uh, didn't carry out enough ground investigation to perhaps define as the features properly in the ground, potentially anyway, and 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 that um, you know that might have contributed to, to the problem. If you like, the scale of the problem perhaps wasn't wasn't uh, fully understood at the time of the development was undertaken. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to I'm going to come back to uh, the question that, that's, that's next in the list, and and just stick okay. with the and uh, with the, as an investigation question. So, is there much evidence of lidar surveys picking up much in the way of subsidence features in the Maidstone area, particularly outside of urban areas? Yeah, I think lidar is quite an important, quite um is is quite a good tool actually, and um, yeah, we've had good experience of. Um, in, in quite a few areas, whether it's chalk, limestones, you know, high, high formation, whatever, you, you, these sort of areas where where lidar is, is is very good at picking up subtleties in in changes in ground level and where subtle hollows may exist at the surface, or whether the lineage where they are circular, subcircular, or linear, whatever. It, it, I think it's quite a powerful um, tool to to use and can be very useful. So that question was from David Hull. And, and perhaps the, the last one, uh, a question of the, of the union is from uh, Chelsea Ao Young, and it's looking a bit further ahead, really. And, and uh, the question is, did, did any of the cases uh, have a uh, long-term groundwood as ground stability monitoring required after the mitigation measures? And any recommendations on that? Right. Uh, the particular cases, studies I've described, I'm not aware of any uh, longer term monitoring measures that were put in place, because I would think when, once the treatment was um, complete, it was, you know, it was validation, of, it was validated, tested, and and and, and satisfaction that, uh, that the that things were completed. But I have had experience of other jobs, should we say, elsewhere, in, in, in uh, where perhaps because of this perhaps the, the the scale and the economics involved that you can't give a hundred percent well say hundred percent you can never give a hundred percent but you can't give perhaps a, a, a solution that um where, whereby the, the, the long-term performance can't can't necessarily be guaranteed and there are still some inherent remnant risks and and therefore in such situations you may want to carry out uh, monitoring of of structures or, or, the, or areas of ground um, so you might might be using a mixture of it, it could be looking at the ground by something like insar over its larger areas maybe to see whether there's still movement um, maybe from as an example sort of ground ground motion recorded uh, or alternative it could be something that's actually got tilt monitors or settlement monitors attached to buildings because often these can be you know fixed to buildings and you can get uh, remote uh, sort of links to to websites or whatever, and and you know um, trigger levels and that sort of thing, you know, set up so that people are are, are monitored and, uh, or the buildings are monitored and then made aware if a trigger is exceeded, things like that. So such things are are certainly uh, um, available out there and uh, and 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 are uh, are installed and used. Well, that's great. Thanks a lot, Clive. Very, very, very interesting talk this evening. It's obviously generated a lot of questions. So, so thanks for taking the time uh, to answer all those questions with, with very detailed responses. So, uh, it, um, in the traditional way, perhaps uh, some of you might like to come off mute and, and maybe give Clive an actual audible applause, or, or perhaps put some uh, emojis in there uh, on the screen, uh, giving him your thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, j just for those people who are still on the call, uh, we've got a bit of a summer break now. Uh, there, there isn't a talk in, in August. And, and at the moment, I'm not absolutely sure that our September, September talk is pinned down. But we will, be, uh, we will be having something in September. So watch out for the adverts. And uh, have a good summer break. And thanks for attending tonight. Cheers. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Bye for now. Bye. Thanks all. Yeah, you can take it up, you can come back to it. Yeah.